Our goal here is just to provide uh, a, with the full group uh, a bit of a table setting uh, and level setting uh, information before we dive into the scenario that we, we plan to um, present. And we're going to keep that to 15 minutes or less so we can really focus on, on the discussion with, with all of you. As, as part of that, we'd really like to cover the evolving threat landscape, some of the trends we are seeing, and uh, a few of the key points uh, related to the board's role in, in a cyber incident, which, which obviously is very different from that of, of management. So in terms of the, the threat landscape, and I'm going to keep my presentation to uh, about five minutes here, uh, and it's impossible to do justice to, to the entirety of what um, the news and cybersecurity practitioners have been tracking in, in the area of cybersecurity, but I would make a few observations. Um, the first is that cybersecurity risk is, um, it is intensifying, and it is intensifying in a number of different ways. One way is that it's becoming more disparate in terms of the threats that we are seeing and, and the types of um, cybersecurity risks that, um, that companies are facing. Certainly there is the risk of a destructive attack like a ransomware attack, the Colonial Pipeline incident that, that has been in the news recently. But companies are also facing risks from um, nation state actors and others who are interested in stealing intellectual property uh, from criminal groups that are interested in financial information and obtaining information about um, either credit card payments or your customers' personal information. And the sophistication of, of the groups involved in these types of attacks um, has, has, has really grown exponentially as well. Whereas um, for a long time, the, the cyber threats we were monitoring were, were those of, um, of, of criminal groups who are out to make a quick buck. We're increasingly seeing um, actors, including criminal actors, who are sponsored by uh, nation states, who are shielded by the nation states uh, that they operate from. And um, there's been a lot of focus, as, as you all may have seen in, in the news, um, related to ransomware groups, for example, responsible for the colonial pipeline and JBS attacks being based in, in Russia and being essentially outside of the reach of, of the law. But it's more than just that. It, it's also the fact that these actors are able to take advantage of training and tools that uh, are increasingly sophisticated, either because they've been shared with them by um, by nation states or other sophisticated um, criminal, criminal groups. So the, the types of threats that companies are facing are, are a lot more dangerous. And at the same time, the attack surface uh, that organizations are facing has, has increased exponentially as well, particularly as companies um, are moving to uh, increasing, increasingly remote work environments, particularly uh, during the pandemic, but but also now is becoming the norm post-pandemic. And, and we're also seeing a lot more interactions that, that used to happen between individuals in, in person in brick and mortar stores that, that are now taking place um, online. So the attack surface that, that these threat actors are going after has also increased. So a few of, uh, of the issues that are top of mind for us, one, one is of course ransomware, um, whereby threat actors are using malware to essentially encrypt or otherwise restrict access to the data of your organizations. Um, uh, these attacks have been going on for a number of years, um, but certainly they, they have become more prominent, uh, both in terms of the extortion demands that are being asked, the, 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 the amount that is being asked has is, is, is become much larger, and the attention that these types of incidents are getting from the public, from Congress, and from others have, have increased. We've seen CEOs be dragged before Congress to answer questions about the circumstances of the incident, whether uh, the company had sufficient cybersecurity standards in place to avoid a, a crippling ransomware incident, and to inquire about the circumstances of, of payments that have been made to criminal actors and whether um, law enforcement agencies were consulted as, as part of that. Um, these ransomware incidents are, are part of a, a broader campaign whereby threat actors are extorting 
uh, groups um, extorting companies uh, based on stolen information. Um, we're seeing threat actors not only encrypt systems, but also steal data and, and threaten to publish it online unless a, a payment is made. And uh -huh. a third area is, uh, is supply chain attacks. Um, in the wake of, of solar winds, the solar winds compromise uh, late last year, um, companies are uh, increasingly focusing on the, the supply chain issues are, um, are, are, are ones that have, that have taken, that have been front and center since the solar winds attack, where companies are focused on the security of their, their software development supply chain, ensuring that threat actors cannot introduce vulnerabilities into the products that companies sell. And we've seen this as an area where there is increased regulation and focus by, by auditors and others to make sure that companies are, are thinking ahead and are in a place where they'll be able to meet the developing standards that are being developed by the US government and, and others to ensure that the supply chain is secure. Um, so with that, let me, let me turn it over to uh, Mark David McPherson um, to, to cover uh, the, the next topic as part of our overview. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. You know, most for the most part, this is a uh, discussion about how to respond to um, some of the cybersecurity threats that Alex described at the board level. Um, and we want to spend, of course, the vast majority of our time on that. But the background here is, of course, the duty of care that as directors you owe to your companies. Um, this is familiar, this is nothing new and nothing that you haven't seen before, um, but we thought it would be helpful to review this background duty as we think about how, as a director, you should respond to some of the types of um, scenarios Alex laid out and the hypothetical scenario that we'll go through in our tabletop exercise. So again, the standard here is, is very familiar, should be to you. Um, as, a, as a director, you have a duty of care to the company and to the company shareholders, which means that um, primarily um, the board must act after due consideration of relevant information and proper deliberation. Um, that's a mouthful, um, but basically if there's ever litigation about this, um, the, the, the question that the fact finder would focus on um, primarily revolves around the adequacy of procedures. So this is mostly a procedural issue, which is whether the board had access to the relevant information, whether they received input from the proper managers and, and advisors of the company, whether they considered alternatives, whether they followed a reasonable process and whether they adequately deliberated. All of these are questions. And again, it goes to mostly procedural questions. In this kind of a situation, the board or a court is not going to um, get into the question, you know, per se, whether you the company should or should not have paid a ransom, but rather whether in making that decision, the board acted reasonably with the relevant information, with consideration of alternatives, um, and, and with due deliberation. And for all of these questions, it's entirely appropriate for the directors to rely on the reports and advice of advisors. This, this, doesn't just mean the officers and employees of the company, but it could be outside counsel, in-house counsel for the company, other external professionals. Usually in a situation like the ones we'll be talking about, um, the company hires a forensic um, investigation firm immediately um, to work on figuring out what happened with the incident. It's entirely appropriate for the directors to rely on those professionals as well as professionals at the company. Uh, so once again, the next slide, please, Peter, and then um, we'll finish up here on the duty of care and move on to the real stuff. Um, the reason the, the questions from a litigation perspective focus mostly on procedure has to do with the business judgment rule, um, which again, you're all probably familiar with. But the point is that um, it, ordinarily, the presumption is that a board's decision or even a conscious decision not to act is entitled to the protection of the business judgment rule. So a court's not going to substitute its judgment for that of the board, as long as the court finds that the board followed the proper procedures, which here means that the board based its determination on material information, they acted with reasonable diligence and inquiry, they made these decisions in good faith, they made an honest belief that the action taken or, or wasn't taken was in the best interest of the company and that they did all of this without a conflict of interest. Um, 
which is again just to reinforce that we're we're really just talking about procedural questions. And you know, I'm the litigator in the group or one of the litigators in the group. So of course these are the questions that I think about and focus on. Um, I don't want to um, spook you unnecessarily though. There have been cases brought against directors arising out of cybersecurity incidents, but they are relatively rare um, in the grand scheme of things. And more importantly, they almost never succeed. I think there's really been only one that has survived dismissal and, and even gotten to a settlement. Um, and it, I think, I believe it, um, it settled within uh, insurance limits. Um, so it's not to say that litigation is the driver of this, uh, but you know, things to keep in mind as you consider you know, how best you need to fulfill your own duties. And with that, I'll turn it over to Miriam to talk about the substance of what that means, how to, how to fulfill those duties. Thanks, Mark. Just saying what, what Mark said in a different way is one of the most important things you can do as a board member is not become part of management. If you want to get the benefit of those assumptions that the court is going to make, particularly under the business judgment rule and not be personally liable, one of the best ways to do it is to make sure that you are, are not becoming part of management. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do anything, but it does mean that, that you should be very clear about what you do as a board member, as opposed to what it is that management is supposed to be doing. And in that context, there really, you have to sort of think about what is a board member's obligation before, during, and after an incident. During our tabletop, we're going to talk about what the board's role is during, but before an incident happens, today, on all of the boards on which you sit, you can be asking basic questions that will go towards showing that you are taking an interest and that the organization is doing what they need to do. So on this slide are a number of the questions that you can ask really that go to whether or not the company is appropriately scoping the issues, they're appropriately preparing for the issues, that they have the right policies and procedures in place. And one of the questions you can ask is whether your company management and people have done a tabletop, which having done one, you can now talk about what it would be like. Um, after the, at the end, not yet. So, okay. During, during an incident, um, there are definitely, like I said, there are some questions that the board should be asking, but of all the different, of the three buckets, during the incident is where the board is the least active. The board is not going to be deciding whether to pay ransom. The board is not going to be deciding whether to go to law enforcement. The board is not going to be deciding, you know, which forensic firm you should be, the company should be hiring. But the board should be making sure that they are getting appropriate updates, that they feel that management is taking this seriously and is giving them the information that they need. Um, that obviously is very important. And we have had situations where the board loses confidence in management and then does become much more engaged, even in the context of, of an incident. But that's the exception, the tiny, tiny exception. And in order for the, if the board is really in the weeds in an incident, it's because they've lost confidence in management. After an incident, there's lots of stuff that a board can do as well. You can make sure that whatever, you know, has the company look to see what the lessons learned are. If there are lessons that have, have should have been learned, are they being appropriately implemented? Are the right resources being put, put forward in order to make sure that the changes that need to be made are getting made? So those are sort of the, the three buckets and the way we like to think about it. And like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna do the tabletop, which is really gonna be focused on what does the board do during because the before and the after should be very similar to other activities that you do as board members. So just very quick, um, why do a tabletop? And here's just the list of all the really good reasons. One of the reasons as a board member is to make sure you can say that you have, that the board has paid attention to this topic, that you, that you are prepared, that you are asking management the right questions. So not only should we do a tabletop now, but we are seeing more and more of our clients doing board level tabletops, working with management of your of the companies on which you are on a board and going through and asking very similar questions to the questions we're gonna be asking you, but talking about that in the context with your board. So these are the reasons that, you know, if you need justification to your, to on, for your company where you sit on the board as to why to do a tabletop, but we are definitely seeing more and more companies asking us, for example, to come in and facilitate um, uh, boards, board tabletops, uh, because it is it is a different character and it is part of companies' preparedness. 